Well, good morning, Renovation Church. Thank you all for being here this morning. Um, I want to let you know that next week we are beginning a a series on the book of Revelation, uh, and we're going to start that next week. Today I'm going to give you an intro to that, but I want to encourage you to invite your friends to this next series. Matter of fact, I would encourage you to invite two friends, two friends at least, to this next series. A lot of people are wondering if we're in the end times and a lot of people, uh, even people who don't believe in the Bible, are fascinated with the book of Revelation. So we're going to start, we're going to hit it next week. So I want to encourage you to bring your friends, and it would be a great series to bring your friends who may not know Jesus to uh, that series. Okay. Uh, to prepare us for that series, I, I'm going to do a little bit of a review. Those of you who I've pastored for a number of years, uh, I preached on this topic before, uh, but I want to talk to you about the next big thing on God's prophetic calendar. Okay, the next big thing. If God had a calendar, what's the next big day? You know, I'm not the most organized person. You can ask Judy. Uh, I'm not the most organized person when it comes to calendars. I don't like looking at my calendar for some reason. I don't know. It stresses me out a little bit. And when I do look at my calendar, I tend to look at the next big thing. You know, I don't look at details. I look at the big, big, the next big day. So, for example, uh, about 10 days ago, the next big thing was Judy's birthday. Judy turned 27 uh, about 10 days ago, and, which is strange because we've been married for 32 years. I don't know how that worked out, but uh, she looks like she's 27 and we celebrated that. That was a big day. What's the next big day on God's prophetic calendar? Well, a number of the church fathers referred to it as the translation. It is, it is known better today, uh, more generally, as the rapture of the church. So I want to teach you about the rapture today, and uh, we're going to cover a lot of ground. We have a lot to cover, so I want to encourage you to take notes on your outlines. We're going to do an old-fashioned Bible study. You all ready to do a Bible study this morning? You're going to learn some scripture this morning. I want to begin with encouraging you to open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and uh, let's start with a definition from the great theologian, Wayne Grudem, of what the rapture or the translation is. The rapture is the taking up, the taking up or snatching up of believers to be with Christ when he returns to earth. The taking up of believers. Now, where does Dr. Grudem get this phrase, taking up from? Well, the scriptural basis for this definition is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, verse 17. This is the Apostle Paul, St. Paul himself. He says, after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up or taken up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. I love that last sentence, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Heaven is real you guys, and we're going to be there with the Lord forever. Isn't that great news? Hallelujah. That's a, that's a moment for an amen. 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 Paul says that there's an event in the future in which the church will be caught up, will be taken up, and will actually meet Jesus in the clouds of the sky. If you were to die tomorrow... Your spirit would separate from your body, and it would go up, to, so to speak, and meet Jesus, and your spirit, your soul would go to heaven, and your body would be left here in the grave. But at the rapture, both your soul and your body will go to heaven. You'll meet Jesus with your body, and you'll be given a new body. We're going to talk about that in a little while, but you will be caught up translated. Translated means to be taken from one place to another, changed from one place to another. When we translate the Bible from Greek and Hebrew, we we take it from Greek 
to English. We change it. We take it up to a different place. The phrase that is uh, translated in our Bibles, caught up, can be translated also uh, taken up, snatched up. It can be translated raptured. Uh, Rapture comes from the Latin Vulgate translation of the Bible, which is an old Latin version of the Bible. So some people claim that the word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, that's right. In English, it isn't in the Bible. But if you're reading uh, reading a Latin Bible, the, the phrase caught up there would be translated rapture. You would see the word rapture. So uh, that's where theologians get the the, this uh, name, the rapture, to refer to this uh, event. Uh, and that's the common usage of that phrase, caught up. I have to say, however, I'm not a big fan of the term rapture because in our culture, we have, that, that term has now been associated with sexuality, romance. Uh, there's a lot of songs that have the word rapture, you know, pop music. Anita Baker had a song called uh, Raptured by Your Love, something th- to that effect. Uh, Blondie had a song called Rapture. Remember that song, Raptured by Blondie? Ding, 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 ding. Rapture. Remember that? It was a weird song. You know, there's a guy from Mars coming out of a UFO with a guitar. I have no idea what she was talking about, but uh, Rapture's in our music. It's in our romance novels. If you go to Walmart and you go to the book section of Walmart and look at the romance novels. They'll have those novels with the guy with his shirt off and he's got Thor hair in a perm, you know, and he's riding a horse and uh, there's a woman behind him and it'll say the rapture, you know. That's often uh, how the word rapture is used. Whenever uh, I use the term rapture, Judy pictures me with my shirt off on a horse and uh, wearing an old spice. So that's kind of the way it's used in our culture. So I don't like it because of that, you know. Uh, also, it has theological baggage. Uh, people uh, in the church, especially in the history of America, have used the term rapture with weird theological connotations. They've added things to it. Uh, like, for example, uh, way back when uh, the year 2000 happened. Uh, for those of you who are, weren't around back then, uh, year 2000 was a big deal back in the day uh, because the computers in our country apparently weren't set up to, to uh, turn over to the year 2000. They were just set up to 1999. So everybody, there's a lot of people freaking out that the end of the world was going to happen at Y2K. And uh, we had this, uh, I was in Wisconsin at that time, we had this couple in our church that sold all their stuff. They went out and bought some barn out in the middle of a field somewhere and got, you know, collected, you know, cans of spam and they bought shotguns and all these weapons and they totally freaked out and they believed in the rapture, but they had this weird idea of this fundamentalist, really extreme view that, that wasn't biblical, and they kind of were expecting the zombie apocalypse. And uh, there's been a lot of weird things associated with the term rapture. So personally, I like the term, the translation, better. Uh, a number of the early church fathers used that. Even in the Bible, in some sections, uh, can tr- uh, translate the rapture, the translation. But anyway... This event in theology probably is best known as the rapture. And you can see it's most definitely in the Bible. Uh, Some people claim that the rapture is not in the Bible. I don't know how you can read the Bible and say the rapture is not there. We just read it. There's no question that the Bible clearly teaches and affirms the rapture. At some time in the future... Jesus will return from heaven, and if you've accepted the gospel, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he lived a perfect life, that he died on the cross for your sins, that he rose again, if you believe that and you've given your life to Christ, you will literally be raptured. You will be taken up to meet Jesus in the clouds, and you will be with him forever. And other passages about the rapture say that your body will be transformed. 
and you'll be given a perfect, indestructible, heavenly body at that time. Now, I don't know about you, but there are some things that I don't like about my body, especially as I get older. I'm, I'm hitting my mid-50s, can't do some things that I used to do. I try to take care of myself, but my body does not perform the way it used to 20 or 30 years ago. Man, I used to be able to throw a football. I had a perfect spiral. I could, I could hit a stamp on the 20-yard line back in the day. Now I can't throw a football hardly anymore because I got this shoulder thing going on that hits you. If you've been lifting weights all your life, you, you, your shoulder turns to gravel. And I try to throw that ball, and it hurts now. Although I have to say this, I've become very good at throwing the ball underhanded. I can, I can throw the ball almost 30 yards underhanded. So when I'm coaching football and they're like, coach, give me a ball. I'm like, Pew! you know, I throw it like that. And by the way, have you ever noticed that on, when you're watching an NFL game or college game, all the refs are my age and you never see a ref throw a ball overhanded. He always goes Pew! like that. Uh, so I've become very good at doing things underhanded. Uh, that doesn't sound right. But anyway, uh, I don't like some of the things that are happening to my body, but the Bible teaches that one day at the rapture, we will be given a heavenly body, and it's described as indestructible. And personally, I believe that we all deep down inside know this. That's why we're fascinated. I've shared this with you before, but I think we have echoes of heaven. The Bible teaches we have echoes of heaven in us. And I think that's why we're fascinated by superhero movies. Because deep, deep down inside, we know instinctively that we were made to be like them. Adam and Eve were like them. And so every man wants to, wants to have a body like Superman. Every woman wants to have a body like Wonder Woman. One day we're going to have superhero bodies. That's another sermon, but here's the bottom line. If you've accepted Christ, the body says, or the Bible says that one day he's coming back to you and you will meet him in the clouds and he'll take you to heaven. Now, some have a hard time believing that. Some people, you may have wandered into church today and you're not quite a believer and you're thinking, this is crazy, man. That's crazy stuff that he's preaching. And even, even Christians have a hard time believing this. They think it's kind of loony, you know, and that might be you. You might be here today and you believe in God, but you're like, man, this stuff about being caught up in the air and having a new body, that sounds weird to me. I don't, you know, I, have, I, don't, I don't really believe that. My question for you is, why don't you believe it? I mean, the Bible clearly teaches it. And you don't have any problem believing other things that the Bible teaches. For example... You don't have a hard time believing the Bible when it says that all of this was created out of nothing by the word of God, that there was a time in the history of the universe where the universe did not exist. There was a beginning to the universe. I mean, science has proven that. The Bible says that the universe began with the one who didn't begin, the one who's always existed. God himself, and then you spoke all of this out of nothing. You believe that? You believe the Bible when it says that? You believe the Bible when it says that uh, God sent his son to become one of us? You believe the Christmas story? You believe that happened? That Jesus existed? That he lived a perfect life? That he died on the cross for you and rose again? If you believe all of that, you believe the miracle of the resurrection and Jesus got a glorified body, you know, Jesus is walking around healed after the resurrection. Most of us believe that. So let me ask you a question. When the Bible says that God created all of this out of nothing and that God also came to this planet in the form of Jesus Christ and miraculously rose from the dead, when the Bible says all of that, you believe it. If you believe that, why do you have a hard time believing the Bible here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 where it promises that the rapture is coming? Why is that so hard to believe? I mean, when you think about it, the track record of the Bible, when it, when it predicts something, 
Roughly a fourth of the Bible is prophetic, okay? And a lot of those prophecies have been fulfilled already. There are times in Scripture where the Bible present, uh, uh, predicts the exact date of an event before it happens. Uh, and the track record is 100%. It's never been wrong, okay? So, for example, the Bible predicted Alexander the Great before he was even born in the book of Daniel. We're told also in Daniel the exact day, you guys, the exact day, puts numbers on it. And he tells us the exact date when the Messiah would enter Jerusalem riding a donkey. And Jesus rides into Jerusalem riding a donkey. It's called the triumphal entry. It happens at the exact day that Daniel predicts this is going to happen because the Bible says it will happen. And the question is not really, will it happen? The question is, do you have a reservation? Are you going to be included in the rapture? Or to put it another way, who is going to be raptured? Well, the Bible says that the church is going to be raptured. A people who believe in God, who believe in Jesus, who have accepted the gospel. And it's going to be both people who have already died in Christ. It's going to be the church of all time. Those who have gone before us and those who are currently alive will be raptured. Both the dead and the alive in the church will be raptured. So if you've accepted the gospel, you died today, even though you're dead and buried, you're going to take part in the rapture. And if you've accepted the gospel and you're alive when the rapture happens, you're going to be taken right up while you're alive. So both groups are going to Uh, take part in the rapture of the entire church of all time. We're talking billions of people are going to be raptured. And let me show you where I'm getting that. Let's read uh, verses 13 through 18 carefully. I want you to pay attention to this. Here's the Bible study part of this. I really want you to pay attention to every word and read this as if you've never read it before. Okay? And just ask yourself, what is this saying? Uh, Starting in verse 13. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. Jesus referred to believers who die as having fallen asleep. When you die, you don't cease to exist. You're just taking a nap and you wake up in heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So Jesus, he's using Jesus' language. We don't want you to be ignorant of those who have died in Christ, who have fallen asleep, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. We believe that. We believe the Bible when it says that. And so, and therefore, we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, Jesus said this, okay? I don't know about you, but as one pastor said, when When somebody raises from the dead, I'm going to tend to believe them, all right? Jesus rose from the dead, and according to his own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left to the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, And the dead in Christ will rise first, and after that we who are still alive and are left will be caught up, will be raptured, will be translated together with them, those who have just been raised from the dead, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Encourage each other as you look toward the end time. Now, did you see it in the passage? Both the dead in Christ and those who are alive in Christ will be raptured. Now, I want to read it again, and I'm going to comment as I go through it, all right? But I want to give you the context of the passage. You may want to write this down. A text without the context is a con. A text without the context is a con. And that's how cults get started. 
They rip verses out of Scripture. They take them out of context. And it seems like the verse is saying one thing when it's really not. You've got to look at the context to understand what the verse is saying. And many cults do this. For example, the other day, I was about two weeks ago, I believe it was after church, I was just about to take my Sunday nap. I'm tired on Sundays, y'all, because I, you know, I'm coaching football. I coached uh, at two games this week, and then I went to the Air Force game to be with one of my players who's playing for Air Force. And, you know, I got home Saturday. I was exhausted. And by the time I'm done preaching, I just don't have any gas left, and I, you know, I like to take my nap, and I don't want to be interrupted. And, you know, I'm, I just had my big lunch. I, I reward myself and let myself eat whatever I want for Sunday lunch. So I eat like a big heavy meal, so I'm even more tired, right? And, uh, you know, so I had my banana pudding or whatever, and I'm about to take my nap, and somebody knocks on my door. I, I don't like solicitations at my house. Am I the only one? You guys hate it when people knock on your door and solicit so anyway, somebody's knocking on my door, and there's two people standing there, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, my dogs are going crazy. So I open the door, and they're like, hello, sir, do you, would you like to hear about how the world is going to end? And I'm like, oh, brothers, some of these people. And I, I said, no, nah, I don't really need to, I, I already know, I'm a pastor, and I've written a book on the end times. And they were like, oh, you're a pastor, huh? And I'm like, are you guys Jehovah's Witnesses? And they said, no, 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 we're, we're a Christian denomination. Right? We're a, we're, we fully believe the Bible. And I was like, okay, well, good to talk to you. And I, and I want to go back and take my nap, right? And then this lady goes, well, would you, did you know that God, uh, that there's a God the mother as well as God the father? And I'm like, no, there isn't. That's not biblical. That, that's, that's unbiblical what you just said to me. Well, let me show you in the Bible where, you know, God, there's, there's two gods. There's God the Father and God the Mother. I'm like, that's not biblical, ma'am, and I don't have time for this. I'm sorry. Mm-mm. And uh, she was going to try to convince me that the heavenly Jerusalem was God descending from heaven in the book of Revelation, which is one reason why I want to do a teaching on the book of Revelation, because a lot of people have these cultists come to their doors and they've never read the book of Revelation. They don't understand it. And they buy into this nonsense, and they're ripping passages out of context, out of biblical context. That's what's happening. So text without the context is a con. That is a con. All right, so what's the context of this passage? Well, there are two questions, and how do you find out what the context is? You you ask uh, this. You ask, what are the questions that the text is answering? Okay? What was the original audience seeking to know? And there are two questions, at least, that the Thessalonian church was asking St. Paul. They were asking uh, St. Paul these two questions. The first question is, what's going to happen to our dead loved ones when the rapture happens? So, you know, uh, my grandmother who died 10 years ago, they're asking Paul, what is going to happen to her? She loved Jesus. Is she going to miss the rapture? Is she on Mount Olympus somewhere? What's going to happen to her? I'm worried about it, you know? And this is early in the history of the church. And, you know, what's going to happen to my best friend who just died of cancer or was just persecuted to death and they believed in Jesus? What's going to happen to them at the rapture? That's a reasonable question that they ask Paul. The second question is, who's going to be judged at the end of the world? We know that judgment is coming. And by the way, everybody knows judgment is coming. I mean, even atheists know judge, judgment is coming. That's why there's this kind of false religion out there. Uh, uh, people instinctively know the human race should be judged. So there's all these substitute religions out there. Now, I'm an environmentalist, just so you know, but I'm a biblical environmentalist. You take God out of environmentalism and you start worshiping nature. And so we we see these themes all the time in our television shows, movies, articles, that nature's going to judge humanity, right? In all these shows where weather is going to turn bad, the earth's going to turn upon us. You know, Jurassic Park movies are that are, are has that have those messages. They're all apocalyptic, okay? And that's a huge theme in our culture right now. I mean, 
The Walking Dead is an apocalyptic series, and it's one of the most popular series that has ever been produced on television. Uh, all the superhero movies are apocalyptic about the end and the messages. We're going to get judgment. Well, they're right. There's going to be an end to the world as we know it. The Bible teaches it's going to be exactly seven years long. It's going to be seven years of absolute, I'm not exaggerating, it will be hell on earth. Hell will literally be on earth. And it will be horrifying. It will be the worst time that the world has ever seen. You don't want to, you don't want to see that. You don't want to be around. And we're going, to, we're going to look at it in depth in this next series. But they're asking, who's going to go through that? Am I going to go through that? Is the church going to go through this seven-year tribulation, this time of judgment? That's a good question to ask Paul. If Paul were sitting here, if we could get Paul to come down from heaven and I could ask him a, que- a number of questions, St. Paul himself, he'd be sitting here. That would be so cool, wouldn't it? And one day we're going to get to meet him, by the way, in heaven. I would, I would, know, would know, want to know all kinds of stuff. Like, what, what is heaven like? Paul, is there bacon in heaven? There's got to be bacon in heaven, right? I would ask those types of questions. Is there football in heaven? Of course there is, because I will not be happy if there's no football in heaven. But one of the questions that they asked, because they had him, well, well, they asked him two questions. What's going to happen to my dead loved one in Christ at the rapture? And who's going through the judgment? And those questions are relevant today, aren't they? And that's the context, all right? Good questions to ask. Now let's read... This passage again, with that as the backdrop, starting in verse 13. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. Okay, so I'm going to answer your question about those who are dead in Christ. Or to grieve, I don't want you to grieve, like the rest of men who have no hope. You have hope about your dead loved ones. You have hope to cope about their state as it relates to the rapture. Have you ever been to a funeral of people that don't believe in God? I've had to preach a number of funerals where the person who was dead did not believe in God. And there have been family members there that did not believe in God. I'm like, why are you even having a funeral? I mean, it's miserable. There's no hope. They have no hope of seeing their loved one again. Very different. I just did a funeral, I don't know, about a month ago, six weeks ago. Horrible death of a young man in his 30s. His parents were sitting right over here, our first service. And as I was preaching about the hope that we have in Christ, they were weeping right over there in those two chairs. And, and I, was, I got choked up with them. Because we have a hope. We don't grieve. Look at what Paul says. We don't grieve like the rest of people who have no hope. What is our hope, Paul? Verse 14, here's our hope. He defines it. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. Hey, you believe the Bible. You believe me when I say Jesus died and rose again. So why don't you believe something else I'm about to tell you? And therefore, and so, we also believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have died in him, who have fallen asleep in him. Your dead loved ones are coming back in the future to the earth in an event. Look at verse 15. According to the Lord's own word, according to Jesus himself, we tell you that we who are still alive who are left to the coming of the Lord, that's referring to the coming of the rapture, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. So he's saying your your loved ones who are dead, they're going to be the first in line at the rapture. And there's going to be a massive event that happens concerning them or concerning you. If you were to die in the next five minutes, you'd be part of this. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command. With the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. By the way, it's going to be a very loud event. Remember I said that the word rapture has some baggage attached to it. Some people have attached the word secret to it. And they say the rapture is a secret event. It's not secret. It's very obvious. There's going to be a lot of loud things happening. 
The loud command is going to be heard from the heavens. We're going to hear the voice of the archangel, most likely Michael himself. And there's going to be this massive sound of a trumpet. And it will be one of those shofar sounds, you know, those ram horn trumpets, the trumpet call of God. And then this event is going to happen. The dead in Christ will rise first. There's going to be a massive resurrection. And everybody who's ever died in Christ, their bodies are going to be resurrected. Your dead loved ones, they're going to be resurrected and they're going to be transformed according to 1 Corinthians 15. And they'll be given new bodies. This body is a seed, Paul says. It's a seed that will be transformed into something beautiful, just like a seed can transform into a beautiful oak tree. Okay? So there's this massive resurrection. It's not a zombie resurrection. It's not an episode of The Walking Dead. Their bodies will be transformed into glorious, heavenly bodies fit for heaven. Verse 17, and after that resurrection... We who are still alive and left will be caught up, will be translated, will be raptured, will be uh, transported together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. So they go first, we will follow, we'll meet Jesus, and we'll all go to heaven together forever forever. Now look at verse 18. Therefore, encourage each other. I'm going to circle back to this. This is really important. Because it says something about the timing of the rapture. Keep in the back of your mind. Paul says, I've told you all of this so that when you look at the end, when you look at the end times, here's the posture I want you to have as followers of Christ. I want you to encourage each other about the end. The end is not something we need to be terrified of. We're going to encourage each other because of this event. We're going to be reunited with our loved ones. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. And you can clearly see that the Bible teaches that the rapture will happen. It will happen to the church. It will happen to the entire church, both those who have died and those who are still alive. And it is presented as a prophetic hope. Uh, Some have called it the blessed hope. And I can't wait for it. I cannot wait for this event to happen. I'm going to get to see my dad in that moment. You know, he died when I was 13. I'm going to see dad with a glorified body. I'm going to get to see the baby that, mis- that we miscarried when we were young in our marriage. I'm going to get to meet that, that child. I'm going to see my grandparents who invested in me. All those years with glorified bodies, you know, all the funerals I've done. I'm going to get to see those people, you know. I just performed that funeral months ago. I'm going to get to see that young man. And he'll have no more pain. It'll be the best reunion that we've ever experienced in our lives. And, and Jesus, the best thing apart of it is Jesus. Jesus is going to be there. We're going to get to see Jesus face to face. The one who has given you everything good in your life. And you will recognize him immediately. Your soul will know who he is. It's going to be awesome. Aren't you guys looking forward to that? Can I get an amen for that amen? It's going to happen. I promise you. It will happen, and there's no question about that. That's really not the question, but a question is, when will it happen? When will it happen? And that question, I'll be frank with you, is a a bit of a mystery. Um, There's a lot of uh, controversy about the timing of the rapture. Uh, Remember I said that, uh, and the Bible teaches that the end of the world as we know it will will be this seven-year period. It'll be exactly seven years. Daniel tells us that. And also, it's alluded to in the book of Revelation. And by the way, in order to study, in order to understand Revelation, you have to understand Daniel, because Daniel is a key to the book of Revelation. At any rate, in the future, there's going to be this massive judgment on the world called, in the Bible, the tribulation. And... Uh, 
theologians and pastors have argued for centuries about when in the re- when in relation to the tribulation is the rapture and uh, some will say it happens before the tribulation some say it happens in the middle and some say it happens at the end if I brought Dr. Wayne Grudem in here who's one of North America's greatest theologians he's written a systematic theology that is a standard at virtually every seminary in the world. And Dr. Grudem would say to you, I have a lot of respect for him, he would, he would make an argument that it happens at the end of the tribulation. Uh, Dr. Gleason Archer, who was an outstanding theologian, again, a brilliant uh, man of God, he would argue that it happens in the middle of the tribulation, and then you would have Dr. Wa- John Walbert, who was... Uh, in his time, arguably the greatest scholar on eschatology or end times possibly in the world, uh, he, would, he would try to convince you that it happens before the tribulation. Um, and they would make some good points. And so, you know, I want to be honest and say the timing of, the, of the, the rapture is somewhat of a mystery in Scripture. However, none of those guys are your pastor I'm your pastor, so I'm going to share with you why I think it happens before the tribulation, all right? And I'm going to give you three reasons why I'm convinced that it happens before the end of the world or the judgment of the world. And so when are we raptured? It seems like to me it will happen before the tribulation, and I'll end with giving you three reasons why. Number one, the church is not appointed to suffer wrath. The church is not appointed to suffer God's wrath wrath. What is the tribulation? Let me give you a definition of it. It is the end of the world as we know it. And the Bible teaches it's seven years of God's wrath. It is a period of God's wrath on the world. And we'll talk more about it later. I will go uh, in detail through the tribulation in this series. But the key phrase here is God's wrath, okay? Uh, Real quick, let me show you just one of many passages in the Bible that refer to the tribulation as a time of God's wrath. Zephaniah 118 says this, speaking of people who are rich, who make fun of the Bible and make fun of biblical prophecy and find themselves uh, in the tribulation, it doesn't matter if they're rich. And look at what Zephaniah says, the prophet. He says, neither their silver nor nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's what? The Lord's wrath, okay? Uh, The term day in Scripture often refers to an extended period of time. That's how it's been used here. It's a time when God directly uh, hits the earth with his wrath. Uh, We still use the term day like that today. Uh, I will have my day in court. We're not talking about one day. We're talking about a period where I will get my say. There will be a period, a day of the Lord's wrath. This is referring to the tribulation, okay? It's just one of many passages that clearly say the tribulation is the time of God's wrath on the planet. planet. So remember the question, who's going to go through the judgment, the tribulation? That's the context of 1 Thessalonians Let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 10. Paul answers the question. He says, now, brothers, about times and dates, about the end, he's talking about, we don't need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord, the tribulation, will come like a thief in the night. Okay, he mentions the day of the Lord. It's synonymous with the judgment. Paul says it's coming like a thief in the night to people, all right? Which people is it coming like a thief in the night to? It's going to happen suddenly. It's going to happen without warning. Uh, The biblical term or the uh, theological term for that is imminence. It will be imminent without warning. Verse 3, what people is he talking about that this end is coming like a thief in the night? Well, it's not us. It's other people. Watch this, verse 3. While people, not you, while people are saying peace and safety, people who've ignored the Bible, they think it's a joke, we're all going to be fine, 
calm down. While people are saying that, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman. And they, notice he's talking about a different group of people than the church. They, not you, they will not escape. And then Paul introduces another group, which is not they, is the church. And he says, there will be people who think nothing's going to happen to them. They're going to say peace and safety. They mock God's word, but they will not escape the judgment. And then Paul turns back to the church. Notice the contrast. In Greek, that's known as a contrast of conjunction. Verse 4, but. They, but now I'm going to talk about you. Okay, but you. Are you guys following me? You guys following me on this? It's a little complicated, but there's a contrast. There's two groups of people he's talking about. Very clearly, this isn't, I'm not, this is the natural reading of the text. Verse 4, but you brothers, church, renovation church, you are not in darkness that this day should surprise you like a thief. You're not going to experience this time like they will. It's not going to come on you like a thief in the night. Why? Because, verse 5, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We don't belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep or clueless, in other words. But let's be alert and self-controlled for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. Paul uses the illustration of light and darkness. He says, you church, you renovation church, your sons, your daughters of light, of righteousness, God, verses 8 through 10 are really important here. I want you to pay attention. I know I'm going kind of long, but look at what he says to the people of the light, the church. He says, but since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. He's saying, put on hope. All right. Now pay attention. You ready for this? What's our hope? Verse nine, when it comes to the end times, Who's going through the judgment? What's our hope? For or because, you can have hope, because God did not appoint us to suffer what? Wrath. The church is not appointed to suffer wrath. To suffer wrath. What is the tribulation? We saw it in Zephaniah. It is the time of God's wrath. We're not appointed to that. God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation. And that word salvation in the Greek can be translated rescue. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, he's appointed us to receive a rescue through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, so he's going back to the theme of the rapture. What about my dead loved ones in the rapture? Whether we're awake or asleep, we may live together with him. So why do I believe that the rapture will happen before the tribulation? Well, one major reason is the tribulation is described as the time of God's wrath. We're told we're going to be rescued from the wrath to come. How are we rescued? By the rapture. We're taken out before the end of the world happens. Okay, now some people really object to that. And, they, and the reason is, I remember studying this in seminary, the reason is the church deserves to go through the judgment. Are you kidding me? We deserve to go through the judgment. Have you looked at the state of the church in America? We should be judged. And they're absolutely right. The state of the church is ridiculous. I mean, the lack of commitment to Christ among all of us is absolutely appalling. And, and their, their argument is absolutely right. But since when do we go to heaven and escape judgment? based on how good we are. We are not saved because we're good. We do not get to heaven because we're good. We get to heaven because of what? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for your mistakes, for my mistakes. Praise Jesus, we're going to heaven. Amen? Yeah. So that's why we're not going to suffer God's wrath. It has nothing to do with whether we're, we're good or not, knuckleheads. So we get to live with him. All right. Reason number two uh, that I believe that it's before the tribulation is Paul points to a positive future 
not a terrifying judgment. Paul points to a positive future, not a terrifying judgment for the church, okay? Now, we're going to see in the weeks to come how terrible the tribulation is. It's literally hell on earth. It's, it's terrifying. It's worse than any horror movie you've ever seen. But whenever Paul talks to the church about the end times, he always encourages. He always presents it as a positive in the future. Let me give you an example. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. We already saw it in in, uh, chapter 4 where he says, encourage one another, right? After he talks about the rapture, then he, he says, therefore, encourage one another again. And build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. So whenever Paul talks about the end times to Christians, to real Christians, He says, be encouraged. Now, that seems strange to say if the next thing on the prophetic calendar is us going through the worst time the world has ever seen. Hey, you're going to go through a time when a third of the earth is going to be scorched in massive um, forest fires. Uh, Hey, you're going to go through a time where a third of the oceans are going to dry up and there's going to be a massive famine throughout all of the earth. And by the way, there's going to be a million-man army that will rise up and declare war. And there's going to be the, the biggest world war that the world has ever seen be encouraged. You know, that doesn't make any sense, right? Doesn't make sense. You're going to go through the tribulation. Have a nice day. Uh, that's not, it's strange that he would do that. Real quick, 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 9 through 10. Let me give you another example of this. And by the way, I think this is a slam dunk, this verse here. Um, he's talking to the church. He, talk, he talks about how they turn away from false gods to accept Christ. Look at what he says. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. They tell, they tell he's talking about people who have reported on this, this church. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And, and to wait for his son from heaven. You guys, I'm so encouraged by you guys because you turned from your idols and now you're waiting for Jesus from heaven, whom he raised from the, get, the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the what? The coming wrath. What is he talking about, the coming wrath? He's talking about the tribulation. And it seems to me, I mean, if you read that naturally and you don't read into it, it seems very obvious that Paul is saying that we're supposed to wait for Jesus to rescue us from the coming wrath. How does he do that? By the rapture. The rapture is a rescue mission. Final reason I think the rapture will happen before the tribulation is the rapture is described as coming without notice at any time. Okay, whenever... The Bible talks about the rapture. It gives the, the indication that you won't be able to predict it, right? Uh, in theology, that's called the doctrine of eminence. We just saw in 1 Timothy 1 where it seems to say that the rapture is the next big thing on God's prophetic calendar. That's the thing we're supposed to be looking for. We also saw in 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 4, it's hard to say Thessalonians multiple times, Thessalonians, but anyway... 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, we saw that the trib is going to come on unbelievers quickly, without warning. Like, what's the picture he gives? Like a thief in the night, right? That suggests that there's not going to be any warning before the rapture, all right? Let me show you another description of the rapture. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52. Paul says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. But we will all be changed in a flash. Look at the language here, how quick it is. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Our bodies will be changed at the rapture. He says it's going to happen in a flash. You ever seen a camera flash? In the twinkling of an eye. Everybody blink your eyes real quick like that. See, I didn't even see some of you blink your eyes. It was that quick, without warning. That's the language that you see over and over again when the rapture is being talked about. Um, It's fast. 
over and over again, it's presented as imminent. It's the next big, and that suggests it's the next big thing on God's prophetic calendar. And here's why. Let me see if I can explain this without going into too much detail. But when the Bible talks about the tribulation, it gives very specific events that will happen. And we will see that. We'll study that. The first event of the tribulation will be that uh, there will be a world leader. Um, He will be a very charismatic figure. He'll be liked by the world. He'll be one of the world's most admired people. He will come out of a ten-nation confederacy in Europe. So there's going to be a European Union. That's why theologians, when the European Union was formed, theologians really took note of that because the Bible predicts that. And there's going to be ten nations in that European Union. And he's going to rise to the top. He's going to be the president of the European Union. And he's going to negotiate a peace plan in the Middle East. And he's finally going to bring peace to the Middle East. This will be the treaty of all treaties. And that, when the moment that treaty is signed, the Bible says a clock will start. And it will be exactly seven years long. Okay? So here's the problem if you believe the rapture happens at the end of the seven years. You can predict it precisely, which takes away the doctrine of eminence. The rapture is presented as without prediction. We can't, Jesus said nobody knows the day or the hour, okay? Well, if it's at the end of the tribulation, you can calculate from the treaty, seven years later, there's a rapture. It's, it's a precise prediction. You can also predict in the middle, three and a half years, exactly. And so if it happens in the middle or at the end, you have a problem with the doctrine of eminence or the unpredictability of this event. Are you guys following me on this? It's a little complicated. Everybody follow me. If you don't, come talk to me afterwards. So that's one reason why I think that the rapture will happen at any time before the tribulation. And that rapture will happen. And I believe, I think there's good evidence when the rapture happens, it's going to ruin the world because you take that many people out of the world instantly. I mean, societies are going to collapse and that will be great fertile ground for a leader to seize control of the chaos. And that's that, that leader, by the way, is the antichrist and he will have the ability to unite the world at that time. And part of the reason is we're going to be gone. Okay. And there'll be chaos in the world. But listen, um, we could talk about timing all day. I could preach on this for a while. And it's not, it's not heretical if you don't hold to my view. Like there's good theologians, good Bible teachers that would disagree with me on this. They're friends of mine. I wrote a book on this, and I had a friend of mine endorse my book who doesn't believe in the pre-trib rapture, and we love each other. He's a mentor of mine. Um, but here's the really an important thing. It's going to happen. No matter what time it happens, it's going to happen. And the question is, do you have a reservation? If it happens at the end of the tribulation or the middle, the Bible promises that we will be protected somehow from God's wrath. But you want to have a ticket to the rapture. And I believe it can happen in the next five minutes. And it will happen. I had the privilege of studying at Dallas Seminary, which was known for its excellent teaching on prophecy. Uh, You know, that's where Chuck Swindoll went, that's where Andy Stanley went. You know, uh, I had had Dr. John Walbert as a professor. I took him for a course called The Doctrine of the Rapture. And Dr. Walbert was highly, uh, arguably the best scholar on end times in the world. I mean, Billy Graham deferred to him. Billy Graham gave out his books, Oil, Armageddon, and the Middle East Crisis, at his, uh, his um, crusades. And Dr. Grant, or, uh, Dr. Walford would be interviewed on CNN and all this stuff. And uh, he's since passed, passed about, I don't know, 10 years ago. But I got, this, I got to sit under this man, and he was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. He had more than one doctorate. And um, you would ask him a question, and it was as if he had memorized the Bible. He didn't even have to open his Bible up. He would say, all right, turn in your Bibles to Matthew 24, 
and he would start saying the Bible, starting in verse 1. He would say it from memory. And, and not only that, he could do, do it in Greek. Like he could say it in Greek, the biblical Greek, from memory. And he could sight read Greek. And uh, one day, I was very intimidated by this man, not only because of his intellect, but he was old school. He was a rough, he was a rough professor. That was a tough class. He believed in a rigorous study of God's word. And he had a booming voice. He had this great big voice. It was deeper than mine. It was like this. And he was about three inches taller than me. And he was a big man. And uh, one day I got on an elevator with him. And it was just me and him. And I was, I, you know, I was just a young seminary student. And I'm, you know, I'm looking up at Dr. Walver, you know, and he's just standing there. And I mustered up the courage to ask him, Dr. Walver, I'm in your class, your, your uh, Doctrine of the Rapture class. Do you think that the rapture's going to happen soon? Do you think that we're in the end times? And he looked over at me and he goes, well, put it this way, son. If you go to the grocery store today, don't buy any green bananas. <laughs> In other words, it could happen at any moment. You don't want green bananas because you want to eat them right now. You get it? You understand what I'm saying? Man, that was a dud. Anyway, uh, that was true. That's what he told me. It could happen at any time. So listen, do you have a reservation? Are you sure you're going to be uh, included in the rapture of the church? You don't want to go through the tribulation, all right? You don't want to, you don't want to experience the judgment of God. So let's make sure right now. Would you bow with me? Father, I want to thank you for uh, your word here. And I want to thank you for teaching us about the translation, the rapture of the church. Oh, what a glorious hope we have. Our blessed hope. And I can't wait for that experience. And I praise you that it's going to happen. You haven't left us. You're coming back. You haven't forgotten us. And you're going to take over this crazy world. And you're not only going to fix it, but you're going to fix me. You're going to fix my soul. And you're going to fix my body. And I'm going to get to be with everybody that I've loved forever and I'm going to get to be with you and I'm going to get to see you face to face if you're here this morning and you don't know if you got a ticket to the rapture I want you to pray a simple prayer with me and mean it and you just pray this silently we had two people accept Christ this morning if you need to join them Let's do that right now. Let's just settle this question right now. So you just pray this prayer silently. Father God, I believe your word. I believe the Bible. Jesus, I believe that you came and that you are the Son of God. I believe that you lived a perfect life and then you died on the cross to pay for my sins all of my mistakes and you rose again I believe that and you offer me eternal salvation I accept it on the basis of faith I accept it and I give you my life from this point forward you're the boss of my life right now and I want to thank you for giving me a reservation for the rapture. I look forward to that glorious day when I'll get to see you face to face. Now, if you prayed that prayer, would everybody keep your eyes closed? Would you raise your hand if you prayed that prayer just now and accepted Christ as your Savior? I want to thank you, Lord. We have another member in the kingdom. Uh, this morning. Three people have given their lives to you today. I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you'd give them an overwhelming sense of your pleasure right now. You're so proud of them. And I pray that this would be the beginning 
of a thriving walk with you. Now, Lord, I pray for our offering. I pray that it would be uh, honoring to you. I pray that you would also use it to uh, finance the needs of this ministry so we can expand the gospel. And uh, I pray that uh, you would be pleased this morning. I love you. What a great day it's been. I love you, Lord, our returning King. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, the strong Son of God, the one who is going to rescue us from the wrath to come. Pray that in your name, Lord Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thanks for being with us today. If you would like to partner with us in this ministry and give, you can do so at therenovationchurch.org.